What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to Candy For Real. Now, I know, I know, you've been waiting for me to drop a free agency video since 5.01 Central Time when things started, even though nothing really happened until Goran Dragic re-signed. And anyway, a lot of stuff has happened over the past couple of days. You've been kind of waiting for me to do things. And the way I was thinking about it was, I didn't want to flood your sub box with a bunch of different videos when people sign. Now, I understand to some of y'all, that sounds like heaven and me dropping five videos in a day over here, but I think it's better that I take the slow approach and wait until things are kind of died down like they are now and really react to them. Um, today we're talking about the Atlanta Hawks. I want to start a mini series where I talk about every team's free agency to some extent, their draft and kind of project what I think about their team in the future. And we're starting off with the Atlanta Hawks because they were one of the most, if not the most active team in uh, free agency this off season. So be sure to leave a like on the video, subscribe if you are new and use that comment section because you may not agree with everything I say in this video. That's completely okay. It is a discussion at the end of the day. So if you do not know what the Atlanta Hawks have done in this off season, well, yeah, they've been really active. Gallinari signed there on a three year, 61 point five million dollar contract they signed Rajon Rondo to be a backup point guard I'm guessing and they signed Chris Dunn and as I'm recording this video they just do an offer sheet at bogey so again super super active free agency period and I am excited for Atlanta Hawks basketball there are a few things that we're going to question that that maybe they have to get the the wrinkles out um but overall you cannot look at this roster and say that they did not get better and for a team like this it's very interesting when your best player is still on a rookie contract because it opens so many doors. Like, there's a reason why the Atlanta Hawks have so much money, and most of that is due to the fact that Trey Young is playing at an all-star level, and he's still making pennies on a dollar. So some teams, and I think we're trying, we're starting to see more of this um, in the current NBA. When you have these young stars coming to the league, they're like, "Let's get it, let's go." That's what the Mavericks have also done um, to some extent. They're like, "We have this guy on a small contract, so why should we wait until he's 25 when we have to pay him a max and then start to think about trying to compete?" They're like, "No, we're gonna go out there, we're gonna sign some players, we're gonna be competitive," and that's exactly what the Atlanta Hawks have done this offseason. Now, with the signs of Gallinari, Chris Dunn. Um, who else? Rashawn Rondo and maybe Bo Bojan Bogdan Bogey. Not Bojan. Bogey. Bogdan Bogdanovich. Are they a championship contending team? Probably not. But they are a playoff team at this point. So the, the one thing that was kind of weird to me, maybe not weird, but really causes some questions, is the Gallinari signing. If you watch all these Kenny For Real videos, you know that I am a big Gallinari fan, especially in this free agency class. When I was ranking my top free agents, other than, of course, um, Anthony Davis, who we all know is going back to the Lakers, or Brandon Ingram, who's a restricted free agent. Gallinari was that guy. Some people is Montrez Harrell, some people is Fred Van Vliet, but Gallinari was the number one guy for me, and that was mostly because a he is a tremendous, tremendous player, one of the best three-point shooters in the game. He has proven to be able to contribute on winning basketball teams, and he had an interview where he said he was willing to take less money to play for a championship team. So when I hear that, I'm like, oh, we may see him on a team that's already really, really good, and he can be that determinative factor to get them over the hump. Now, he may have went a little bit different direction. He wanted that bag. I mean, you're 31, 32? 31, 32 years old, and somebody's offer you three years, 60 million. You, you just have to go with it at the end of the day, and that's exactly what they did. So I thought he was going to sign to a, another team for the mid-level exception or maybe a little bit more than that, but um, he took his bag. He is a great power forward to put alongside Trey Young. And you notice I said power forward. A lot of people on Twitter have been speculating that Gallinari is going to go back to playing small forward. And I just, I think that would be very rough for not just him, but the entire team on the defensive side of the ball. The last couple seasons where he's seen his most success and been his healthiest has been when he has played the power forward. I looked it up and 98% of his minutes last season were at the power forward position. He is no longer a small forward. The game has evolved along with Gallinari to he is a power forward. Now he cannot keep up up with small forwards on the perimeter he is a power forward and obviously as you know the Atlanta Hawks also have another young very promising power forward on the roster so what the heck does their first day starting lineup look like you don't bring in a guy like Gallinari to have him come off the bench especially for 20 plus million dollars a year and you don't have John Collins come off the bench now the league the logical thing would be like okay let run of them one center 
you don't want that either. John Collins can't play the three. He can't play the five. Gallinari can maybe play a little bit of the three, but not effectively, and he can't run the five either. Both of these guys are power forwards. Now, John Collins, I think as good as he is now, he would be so, so much better if he was able to run the center position effectively. On the offensive side of the ball, having him and Gallinari run the four and five is beautiful for Trey Young. Forget what the wing positions look like right now. On the offensive side of the ball, if it is Gallinari and John Collins, you're going to score 1,000 points a game, but you're giving up 1,001. You just would. There will be zero rim protection or anything like that. And that's why they signed or they traded for Clint Capella, who still haven't played a single minute for them. And they drafted Nyeka Ukangu, who also fits into that lock jam because he can run power forward. But I guess they're trying to hope him, hope for, for him to become a center. But like you, at the end of the day, them running together could be dirty offensively, but dirty defensively too. And, and different uh, meanings of the word dirty in those two things. So I don't know what their starting lineup looks like uh, coming into the first game. Maybe they do try to start both of them and just see how it goes. But you also trade for Clint Capella and have not been able to see him play. It would be a very odd move to trade for him, not really give him a chance in that role and bring in somebody else. You get me? But there's rumors yesterday that John Collins and his camp were looking for a max rookie extension. Listen, before I hear recording this video, Donovan Mitchell got that max um, max, max extension. And well, wait, it happened three minutes ago. He signed the four year, $72 million deal with the Atlanta Hawks. The Kings did not match. Wait, 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 did they? Oh my God. This is, this is so scuffed. If the Kings match this offer, Bogdanovich will be a full no trade clause through the first season and cannot be traded to Atlanta. So I guess it's not really official, but the number would be 72. And maybe when this video comes out, it is official. But four years, 72 is it's crazy. Okay, but back to what I was saying. Um, John Collins' camp wants a max contract, and the Atlanta Hawks may not see him as that valuable. I think John Collins is a very, very good offensive basketball player. But on the defensive side of the ball, he has a lot to work on. And we're talking about a guy that's, what, 22, maybe 23 years old. He has plenty of time to try to put it together. But it looks like the Atlanta Hawks may be thinking about a different direction with him. I mean, you're also drafting Yeko Kongu at 6, who, who is a defensive-minded power forward slash center. John Collins might be on the move, maybe not this offseason, but next season. I'm sure they'll give it some run of him trying to run center this year. But if it doesn't work out, they may flip him by the deadline. They just might, which is kind of sad because I love the idea of John Collins and Trey Young in the pick and roll, potential pick and pop, because John Collins shot with 40% from three. He's a vertical lob threat. And the vertical lob threat sets him apart from Gallinari when it comes to uh, playing with Trey Young. Now, Gallinari brings a lot more, a, a lot different things to Trey Young. I mean, he's one of the best shooting guys. We're talking about Gallinari's like 6'10. He literally will shoot over anybody. And that's exactly what he did in OKC last year. He'll shoot over anybody. Um, but when it comes to fit, I asked this to my guys on my podcast like, who fits more with Trey Young? Right. And of course, long term, you may think John Collins because he's 20 something years old alongside with Trey Young and Gallinari's 30 plus. He's also a vertical lob threat. And Trey Young has shown to, to really like to throw lobs. And it's the same thing with Clint Capella. But I think that the Travis, I think it's still Travis Slink over there. I, you know, fact check that Travis Slink has an idea for this team and they're trying to do that. Bringing in Bogdanovich, bro. This is a team like, listen, the entire league is getting better. The entire league is getting better. Like, we talk about how crazy the Western Conference race is every single year. The Eastern Conference race is about to be similar. Obviously, the talent level is a little bit less, but when we talk about fighting for those last couple seeds, think about, okay, the Bucs are still going to be good. They re-signed Fran Van Vliet and with the Raptors, so they'll be good again. The Boston Celtics may have lost some things, but they'll still be good again. The Pacers still be good. The Heat is still be good. Philly's going to be good. Brooklyn is going to be better. The Orlando Magic didn't make any moves, but for somehow they're always a 40-win team. The Charlotte Hornets made some moves that'll make them more competitive. The Washington Wizards will have John Wall back, I think we'll see. Um, the Bulls and the Knicks... And the Detroit Pistons and the Cavs, I guess, are looking at, like, the bottom teams. But you can even make some cases for the Bulls maybe making some jumps with a new coach and, and some offseason changes. You can make the case that the Cleveland Cavaliers could be looking at a better roster now. So, like, every single team in the league right now will be competitive. So the Atlanta Hawks kind of take where their 20 wins last season. They add Gallinari, they add Rajon Rondo, Chris Dunn, and they add Bogdanovich right now, and they are significantly better. 
you know, Gallinari signing is really good, but I really do like another signing, and that is the Chris Dunn signing. Listen, if you're a Atlanta Hawks fan and you don't really know about Chris Dunn, let me fill you in. We're talking about a top five defender at his position. Bar none. When it comes to guarding guards, Chris Dunn is at the top of the list. He's top five. Listen, you saw that when they, when they had those battles between the Bulls and the Atlanta Hawks, the ones that went to multiple, multiple overtimes. Trey Young was having a hard time. Now, Trey Young is still Trey Young, so he did put up some crazy numbers. But there are periods of time when Trey Young was struggling because Chris Dunn had his number. And Chris Dunn has that amongst across the league when it comes to guards. And last year, when it came to the, the Atlanta Hawks, when Trey Young was on the court, they were a cool team. But when he was off the court, they were a YMCA rec league team. They had no ball handlers. They had nothing. And now they're bringing Rajon Rondo, who just had one of the best resurgence of his career, and then Chris Dunn, who can also run an offense. Who He ain't bringing much else offensively, but he could be a primary ball handler and make some passes. They have an idea. This team is about to be one of the deepest in the league because we ain't even talked about the fact they still have Cam Herter. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> they still have Cam Radish and Kevin Herter. They still have uh, DeAndre Hunter. This team is going to be deep, and they got a lot of mouths to feed at the end of the day. And then they still, oh, they still have uh, Trey Young as their all-star point guard. The Atlanta Hawks is going to be a fun team to watch, and I, I think that Lloyd Pierce has a lot to deal with when it comes to making sure everybody is happy with their playing time and also putting together a winning team, you know? Uh, that's all I have about the Atlanta Hawks. Let me know what you think about the comment section. I'm curious to see what the Sacramento Kings do. Are they going to match it? Will they uh, just let them go? Because that's a lot of money. 72 is a lot of money. And then they also just extended De'Aaron Fox. And they drafted Tyrese Halliburton. We'll see what the Kings do. Thank you all so much for watching. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, we'll probably go daily around here now. The free agency is winding down. And we have a lot to talk about. Maybe tomorrow we'll talk about the Lakers. I don't know. Peace.